It takes more than just investing to build your financial future. But how? What else? Here's what matters. Live from New York City, I'm Lauren Goodwin, and this is Market Matters from New York Life Investments. In this podcast, we bring you the best insights from across the New York Life Investments platform because we believe that by sharing perspectives and engaging with you, our listeners, we can all become better investors. Welcome, everyone. It's the week of August 28th, 2023, and I am excited to share that we'll be kicking off a special series this week called our Financial Futures Series. I have to credit Julia Herman with the idea, who's with us here today. And the genesis of this idea was financial health is about more than just investing. It's about finding the right comprehensive set of tools to meet your specific financial goals. But how, oh, how, oh, how can you actually do that? I'm, I'm serious. We speak all the time on the program about reaching financial goals, but how do you set them in the first place? And once you set them, what kinds of options, including investments, of course, but also in the bigger picture, should investors have on their checklist to ask a financial professional about? So we're here for you, speaking with leaders across the New York life platform and New York Life Investments to unpack the great mystery of how to prepare and then pursue those goals. Our first guest on this series is the, in our humble opinions, very, very talented Amanda Cool. Julia, would you like to do us the honors of the introduction? I would love to do the honor. Amanda has worked her way up through New York Life to become the head of life products and then this year, the head of purchase experience for New York Life. We have had the pleasure of getting to know her, and she was our very first call when we were considering the potentially critical role of life insurance in overall financial goals. So welcome. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, Amanda, I'd love to kick things off today, and let's just start at the high level by means of introduction. Tell us a little bit about your role and your team. What's your central focus? Who do you work with? Sure. Uh, So I was appointed last month to be the head of the purchase experience, as you mentioned. Um, At New York Life, we've really realigned ourselves to value streams. And so essentially, that means we've moved from a world where we were very product-centric and aligned based on life insurance, annuities, long-term care, to aligning more uh, towards an experience for agents and clients. So what I'm really in charge of is the strategy, the modernization, and the operations of the purchase experience for all of our products. That includes wealth products, life insurance, annuities, individual disability insurance. And if you think about it from a very simplistic level, that means for a client or for an agent, from the time you come in the door and apply for a policy, to through underwriting, through suitability, all the way until an agent delivers the policy and you make first payment. And I'm really in charge of being able to um, refine that experience, make a better experience for our agents and clients. And so obviously with that, I have a broad array of stakeholders that I work with across the company. I would say our main ones are certainly service since I'm just the first part of the journey and they take over from there. Agency and agents is critical in getting feedback into us designing these experiences. And then obviously our businesses, so our products, and what makes sense for each of the products and the experiences that we're designing. Well, Amanda, given that you're interacting with New York Life's whole range of products and a whole range of stakeholders, I'm sure it is helpful that you have the rich background that you do at New York Life. You came up uh, from the, the entry level actuarial program Can you tell us about how you ended up in your current position? Absolutely. So I came here in 2005, so I'm almost hitting my 18th year anniversary at New York Life, which has gone by very, very quickly. But I did come in through the actuarial development program. Uh, Funny story, I had started at another company prior to here, and I got here literally by just Googling the best actuarial development programs. New York Life popped up. I made a call, and that's how I ended up here. But I spent nine years of my career here pricing our life insurance products, so I'm very intimately familiar with all of them, have a deep deep knowledge. 
with them. I had moved over to our institutional life area, our bank owned and corporate owned life insurance products, and then really wanted to move a little bit away from the actual realm into the business. I found the connection with clients and agents and agency to be really fascinating. And so I moved in 2016 over to uh, life products at the time, really looking at things from an Inforce perspective, started an Inforce strategy team and grew from there. As you mentioned, I became uh, the head of life products in 2022, responsible for all of our life insurance products from a new business and Inforce perspective, as well as our third party distribution, the operations associated with that and the strategy. And then last month, I had moved over to the purchase experience, which really allowed me to kind of leverage the rich experiences I've had throughout the company, the connections I've made throughout the company, um, and use that in a different way. Well, what you mentioned about being really focused on how clients are using these products, making that experience hopefully better, but also understanding all the nitty gritty bottom up of how mm -hmm. these products are priced in the first place, it's really reflective of, of why we called you for, for this episode. You know, on this podcast, Lauren had mentioned at the top that we normally focus on more of an investing perspective as the investors that we are. And we know that our 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 clients and households build their financial health and futures with a lot more than just investments. So if we dig in specifically on how life insurance can fit into that picture, can you give us a bit of an overview of those key life products that our clients consider? Absolutely. So when I think about the life products that we offer, I really divide it into two different categories. First, protection and then accumulation. So protection products are what you think of when you think about life insurance. It's your term insurance. It's how do I be able to protect myself from those unforeseen events, the unlikely and untimely death of a loved one? How do you replace the mortgage payments? How do you replace someone's income? So that's really what we think of as the most basic form of life insurance. Often it comes in a shorter duration with term insurance or in a longer duration with our universal life products. And those are more used for things like estate protection and longer term needs. And then you have our accumulation products. And this is something that we've really invested in over the past several years and also is our flagship product of whole life. So accumulation products, while they do obviously have a death benefit focus given their life insurance, they offer clients and agents a wealth of other opportunities as well through cash value accumulation. And this is where that you can leverage kind of the tax advantage growth of life insurance over time and are able to access that cash value and many times tax tax-free in retirement. And so with our accumulation products, we have two categories. We have Whole Life, which is our flagship that offers guaranteed cash value growth and access to dividends as well over time. And then we also have variable universal life insurance. And variable universal life insurance offers you not only life insurance protection, but you can also have some exposure to the markets as well. So you can invest your cash value in different accounts that can grow over time with the market. So it offers a little bit more of risk exposure for those that want that, but also the security of a life insurance benefit and also the ability to take distributions potentially tax-free in retirement. And in that space, we focused a lot last year when we launched our Wealth Plus products. And those products are both a whole life product and a variable universal life product that are really focused for those investment-minded consumers. Speaking about experiences in my current role, we designed those products to really align with the experiences of what investment-minded people would want. A quicker turnaround time for underwriting in two days. Alignment to more of an idea of premium rather than pure face amount and death benefit protection. So we've really made a pivot here over the past several years to lean into our accumulation products and really our whole life product products as an example are best in class, certainly in the industry. I just want to highlight for our listeners this point that Amanda is making between protection and accumulation, because as she very rightly said, many people think of life insurance as specifically the protection piece. But this accumulation unlock is really interesting, the sort of meld between insurance and investment opportunities that we'll be discussing more in the series. And Amanda, you've covered a lot of this already, especially given that there's the availability of both protection and accumulation minded products. But why do you specifically believe that life insurance can be such a valuable and or potentially valuable part of a mm -hmm. household's overall financial health? 
Yeah, so we really believe here that there's a focus on protection first, holistic advice and guidance. And what that really means is that in order to build any retirement plan or any financial plan, you first have to have a really solid foundation. If you don't have that foundation to protect against some of the things that Lauren mentioned in terms of an untimely death or mortgage protection, how are you going to develop a plan for your retirement? Everything could be undone that you've been saving for if you don't have that financial bedrock in terms of protection first, holistic advice and guidance. So that first is, I think, a primary thing that has to be discussed and taken care of, making sure you have your protection needs covered. And then from there, I think it can grow. And life insurance can be used in many ways, not only for protection, as I mentioned, but also for accumulation. There are certainly years, right, the stock market goes up and down, and maybe you don't want to take a distribution from your 401k or you don't want to take a distribution for the market because it's down and you don't want to really lock in any losses. You can access your custom whole life or whole life products in one of those years by taking a partial withdrawal or a loan so that you're not locking in the losses. So it really offers a little bit more flexibility in retirement and also make sure that you have a good financial bedrock to your retirement going forward. It's interesting you speak to that because as we've been writing our next economic and investment outlook, we've been finding that 401k drawdowns are starting to creep up this quarter. And so the idea that having a solid foundation from which we can make our investments and really manage investor behavior, especially as times are more volatile, it, it rings really true here. Uh, you've also spoken a little bit to what I'm about to ask, but I'd like to ask it in a more pointed way. Uh, when you think about new products and meeting customers or clients where they are, what are the general problems that you're trying to solve for, both in terms of the product itself, but also the client experience? Sure. So earlier this year, we really wanted to focus on our protection products. I mentioned we spent a lot of time last year really focusing on accumulation. But as I said, we want to make sure we have a good foundation as well. So we just launched um, our new term suite of products, May 15th of this year, and it's really a much more competitive price for these products, especially compared to our peer mutuals. We found that when you looked at us compared to the market, the price wasn't there for the value necessarily that we were delivering. So we had to realign that to make sure that we really had a best in class solution. Later this year, we're also going to be turning to our estate planning product, Universal Life, to make sure that makes sense from a value proposition as well. But I really do think we have a best in class suite of products, and there's not that much more we need to do to shore them up to make sure that we have a full suite of products for our agents and clients. And so after you have that sort of foundation of having really good products, we have to turn to experiences. It's probably where as a company overall, we haven't spent as much time or energy as we should have over the past several years. The pandemic certainly heightened this. Craig talks a lot about the Amazon effect. You know, the, During the pandemic, everyone got used to things being instantaneously delivered to their door. I certainly got used to you know being able to drive to Target. Someone's going to just put my bags in my car for me. I don't have to get my kids out. And I I can just leave. We're trying to provide more transparency to our clients and the agents. So the agents don't have to work as hard in that point, and they can spend more time doing what they do best, providing holistic advice and guidance to their clients. So I'd say overall, you know, we're turning our perspective more to the transparency, the experience, making sure we feel like a modern company to deal with. Well, there you go, folks. A little bit of a peek under the hood in business strategy and how a big company can bring itself a little bit closer to its clients and understand their experience. And I should mention that when Amanda says Craig, she means Craig DeSanto, the chief executive <laughs> officer of New York Life as a whole. Now, Amanda, I would be remiss if I didn't get to ask you a couple of personal questions the way Julia started off the conversation. So just straight down the center, what's your favorite part about this job? There's so many interesting elements. Yeah, I, I would say it's twofold. One, certainly, I love challenges and I love solving problems. My mom was a math teacher. My dad was an engineer. So that's kind of just in me to be able to want to kind of dig in deep, figure out the best path forward. So that's what this role is, right? Trying to figure out how to become a modern institution from a purchase experience perspective. And then the people. That's why I've been here 18 years, is just really building great relationships across the company. You know, I want to come to work every day and be excited to work with the people that I have on my team. And I will say that coming into this role, I've already met such great people, and I know I have a really great team to be able to evolve this experience with. 
Well, I'm chuckling because a math teacher plus an engineer probably yeah. does start with someone who starts their career in actuarial science. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some good, good foundations. And on the point of people, I mean, we ourselves have been so looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I have just one more question for you, which has to do with something unique about this episode, which is we have three women at the helm. Uh, you have risen from a very entry level position in a male dominated industry, insurance and and finance. What are some takeaways or maybe high level points that you can share about your leadership approach or key lessons you've learned from your positions along the way? Yeah, I'll, I'll share one story um, that goes to just authenticity. I would say prior to the pandemic, um, I am a mom of two boys, they're five and seven now. And I really struggled with that of, you know, if my boys, someone heard them on a call or I had to leave early because of something that they had, whether it was a doctor's appointment or whatnot. And during the pandemic, you know, I really had to face that, you know, we were all at home, my boys were not in school, they weren't in daycare, our nanny wasn't there. And I remember this time I was leading um, a meeting of like 30 to 40 people and my younger son, who was probably two at the time, came in and just wanted to snuggle on my lap and just fell asleep. And I just kept running the meeting. Um, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to be both a leader. Um, I have, you know, obviously responsibilities at work, but I have responsibilities at home. And I was going to stop apologizing for the fact that I had these responsibilities at home. And I just owned it. And that was really a pivotal turning point for me because I remember then just going forward, like they'll show up certainly on Mondays or Fridays. Sometimes they'll pop their heads into calls. People know their names. Um, they know a lot of the names of the people that I'm talking to. And I've just owned it from then on because, you know, this is who I am. This is authentic to who I am. Um, and it really makes me a better leader and a better mom having both of those experiences. So I think that was one thing um, certainly that was critical that I learned in the pandemic. And then other than that, um, relationships, I'm really big on having trusted relationships and using that as a foundation to grow good, strong, high-performing teams. So that's something that um, I've done over the 18 years, certainly have a very strong network of relationships across all the different areas that, that I've been in. Oh, goosebumps. Amanda, I think makes so much sense to be an authentic leader in, in your head. But when it comes to making that transition and saying, you know what, I'm going to show up the way that I am at work. That is just so cool. You have brought so much leadership and expertise to this segment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Coming up next, our financial future series continues with Todd Taylor to discuss annuities, what they are, how you can use them and how they work or not with the life insurance conversation we've had today and the investments conversation we're always having. But that's it for today. We'll be back next week with more Market Matters. In the meantime, please remember to give us a like, follow, or review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a question or topic of interest, reach out to us on LinkedIn. As always, you can follow our views at newyorklifeinvestments.com and click the Insights tab. Until then, I'm Lauren Goodwin, and we'll see you next time.